the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Drugs to the rescue. Pfizer starts work on a vaccine for Omicron and Moderna promises one early next year. Both stocks uh, popping this morning. Markets calm down, but restrictions do not. Equity is clawing back some part of the losses from Red Friday. Bond yields soar. Travel stocks, though, lag behind as curbs fall into place. And $150 oil, that's coming. Uh, prices rebound while OPEC delays its meeting. We're going to talk to the analysts behind that 150 call in, in oil for 2023 as spare capacity shrinks. Christian Malik of J.P. Morgan will be joining us. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, I was out of pocket for two days, knee-deep in baking. I see the price action. I see the headlines on Friday. And my first instinct is that who was trading that day? Thin liquidity. Let's wait for the expected bounce Monday morning. Do you know what? Actually, volumes were OK Friday. So I think a lot of people in this new world of being able to work from home did actually step in. I, I admit it was a shortened week, uh, a shortened session, uh, and as a result of which we may have seen some people not there. But nevertheless, uh, certainly here in Europe, it was a volume, it was a high volume True. session. Look, is it, is it a bounce back, uh, a dead cat bounce, call it what you will? I don't know yet. Alex, I think until we know the details around what this new variant is going to do to us, then I think that, uh, that answer is pending. Yeah, or did it just take some froth out of the market, which we were kind of expecting and kind of waiting for that to happen toward yep. the end of the year anyway? Uh, I think that's a perfectly legitimate way of looking at it. I, you've seen vols pick up in foreign exchange. You see vols pick mm -hmm. up in fixed income. Now we see it in equity and we now see it in credit. So maybe that was going to happen at some point. So, yeah, I think it was inevitable that we were going to have some, some bumps along the way. We were already, and I think we should bear this in mind, we were already starting to see significant pickups in Delta. Yeah. It's happening where you are now. It's certainly happening where I am. So that was always going to be a cause for concern. There was likely to be a bump that was going to be major that was going to offset these equity markets. I don't know what it was going to be. Turns out... It was a new variant. Yep, and also we were already seeing markets in some respects roll over a touch, right? Vol was already picking up. Uh, oil was also yep. rolling over just a little bit. There were already some cracks uh, within all of this, which is worth pointing out as well, which begs the question, like, how much can we actually come back from Friday? Yeah, though, I, I just listening to some of the commentators that have been on air throughout the, the morning, they're still pointing to the fact that we're going to see a Santa Claus rally, that we're yeah. going to have a run into, into Christmas, certainly in DM markets. Housing data is just starting to hit the tape. Um, looks a little better than expected on a month-on-month -month basis. So this is pending home sales data out of the United States. The month-on-month -month number coming in at 7.5. The survey number just 1%, so a 7.5% pickup. The prior number was negative, uh, negative 2.3. That's been revised a little further lower. Um, the year-on-year non-seasonally adjusted number, negative 4.7, though the prior number, negative 7.2. So some signs of stability, or maybe even a pickup, Alex, in the housing market. Yeah, interesting stuff there, too. All right, let's go back to uh, Omicron here. The doctor who alerted government scientists to the possibility of a new COVID variant said people infected with Omicron are showing milder symptoms than those who still caught Delta. Governments, though, across the world are still stepping up those travel restrictions. I've decided that we're going to be cautious, make sure there's no travel to and from South Africa and six other countries. There is no scientific justification whatsoever for keeping these restrictions in place. I'm aware that the restrictions are stricter compared to other countries, but we must be as cautious as possible about an unknown risk. It does appear that Omicron spreads very rapidly and can be spread between people who are double vaccinated. His concern, it moved from being a, uh, a variant of investigation to a variant of concern within the space of 24 hours. We call upon these countries that have imposed travel bans on our country and our other Southern African sister countries to immediately and urgently reverse their decisions and some breaking news uh, in relation to this. The U.K. is now urging boosters for all adults. Uh, a second shot 
for those ages 12 to 15. UK urging boosters uh, for all adults, so it no longer pays for a guy to be old. All right, joining us now, Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. Hey, Sam, um, the market reaction Friday swift. The reaction by politicians swift. Should it have been? Um, hi, Alex. Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, I know that, that it's not nice for South Africa and some of the other African nations to have flights and travel banned or made very, very difficult. But then I, I'm also hearing that South Africa is saying that people shouldn't travel between provinces. Uh, so I don't know how, wh why travel within the country is, is, is n not a good idea, but travel, travel outside the country is okay. So I think that, that you just want to slow it down until you know more about it, frankly. And, and, and you know, I'm directly yeah. affected by it. So, you know, it's something that we have to wait and see. Sam, at the moment, the financial markets are flying blind. We had a knee-jerk reaction Friday. We're trying to calculate what our reaction is today, this Monday. Can you just walk me through the timeline of how we're going to learn more about this? What are the key milestones that we need to get to? Yeah, so I would say that what we need to see is in the next couple of weeks, hopefully news coming out of the various companies as to whether their third shot uh, of the current vaccines that they've got induces an immune response that can neutralize Omicron. Remember, they already showed that to us for Delta and Beta. That's number one. Number two, if that's not the case, they've got vaccines against Beta. Does that help? Because Omicron is a bit closer to Beta than it is uh, to other variants. Uh, so that's the sort of information I'm looking for, which I think is the first we'll get in the next few weeks. And then, of course, the how, how much transmissibility is. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk so far, Sam, about mild symptoms uh, in order to sort of show that maybe this isn't a Delta-type scenario. Do mild symptoms automatically mean less hospitalizations and less deaths? Um, to be honest with you, Alex, I don't put any stock in that comment at all at the minute. This is one country with relatively low number of cases, with a much younger population than other countries, different comorbidities, and different levels of background infection. You just can't make a decision on how bad this virus is until you've seen it more broadly infecting people and for longer. So I'm afraid I don't buy that yet, but I wish it to be true. <laughs> uh, that would be nice, yeah. I think there's some upside scenarios here, uh, but at the moment, obviously, the, uh, the muscle memory teaches us to be a little bit cautious. Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you very much indeed. You've just been looking at pictures of Professor Van Tam here in the UK, uh, briefing on where we are in terms of the UK's response. Uh, the UK uh, does seem at this point in time to be accelerating the vaccine program, trying to reach as many people as possible, as Alex was saying, urging boosters for all adults, second shots for 12 to 15-year-olds. There's a kind of gap between 12 uh, and 15 at the moment where you get one shot. Uh, you also don't get uh, NHS access to prove you've had that shot. Hmm. So two shots uh, may end up changing that. I'd be interesting to see whether they change the reporting standards around that second shot. We're going to have an uh, ongoing response here at Bloomberg to what is happening here. We've got a special coming up later on this afternoon on the Omicron variant and the impact these variants are having. It's going to happen at 4.30 p.m. in New York. That's 9.30 p.m. here in London. Let's talk about the market reaction. Christian Lawrence, Rabobank senior cross-asset strategist, joining us now. Um, Christian, fairly straightforward first question. We saw, obviously, a massive route Friday in credit and in equity. We're seeing a timid bounce back today. What do you make of the price action? Well, I think the price action makes sense given the circumstances, but unfortunately, Sam was quite right. We just don't know how the Omicron uh, variant is going to evolve. And we really just don't know what sort of impact this is going to have on markets going forward and indeed on economies going forward. So it adds uncertainty to what was already a blurry outlook. That being said, we have, of course, seen that, that buy, the, uh, buy the dip mentality coming in already. December is usually a very strong month for U.S. equities. We know corporate buybacks are accelerating into year end. So outside Omicron, there were reasons to be bullish equities moving into year end. But this does provide that, that layer of uncertainty for sure. So does that mean buy the dip but with a lot of extra hedges? I think so. Um, in terms of high conviction views, it's difficult to have them right across markets at the moment. Uh, what I do have is that I, I certainly think the US dollar is going to head higher. I certainly think we're going to see higher volatility in interest rate markets. And when it comes to equity markets, look, 
The megatech companies have done a very good job of holding up those headlines. The action has, has and will continue to be below the surface, the rotations into and out of value. I tend to think that at this stage, until we do get more information on Omicron, a slightly cautious approach is warranted. That being said, within the value space, I like financials, I like selective energy, but I'd probably be careful of travel stocks at the moment. Yeah, I think you're probably not alone in that. Um, <laughs> Christian, talking of the cautious response, do you think we get a cautious response from central banks as a result of this? What I'm trying to work out at the moment is what impact this will have on Fed policy, Bank of England policy, ECB policy. There is a danger that if it turns out to be a, a, a difficult variant to deal with, that we end up seeing an impact on the labour market as we see lockdowns or lockdown lights being reimposed. But if that's the case, then we're likely to see also higher inflation. On which, which way do you think the Fed and other central banks will... How, how will they deal with that? Well, I think central banks in most developed countries are really stuck between a, a rock and a hard place, and, and that counts for the Fed as well. We've seen massive repricings of the front end. I think we continue to see that as we get to grips with uh, the, the, the strength of this recovery. And the labour market is a, is a key part of that. There's a lot of focus on the unemployment rate, but of course the participation rate has fallen a lot as well. And that hasn't surged back higher. And we don't know how many people have left the workforce for good and how many will be forced to return to the workforce earlier next year. I tend to be of the view that the wage growth we've seen this year has been more about distortions and that it's less likely to continue as we move into next year, particularly as we see some more Americans forced back into the labour force. But when it comes to the Fed, I tend to think they're going to be pretty cautious. I don't even buy the idea that they'll necessarily raise rates twice next year. I think we may well only get one rate hike next year. And as for the tapering process, well, I tend to think that they're going to stick with the pace that they've already outlined rather than stepping that up at the December 15th meeting. Yeah, and Goldman, though, before Omicron came out, uh, uh, increased their forecast for rate hikes three, three starting in June uh, for 2022. So, Christian, what was really interesting is that before all of this, we, the idea that we were going to get a rotation into value cyclicals and small caps was kind of permeating in the market. Whether or not that was coming true is a different story. Does that push this out altogether, and then you have to go buy the safety and the growth of the big tech? Or can you start to play with that rotation? Well, I certainly like the megatech companies at the moment. You know, they, they have been a, a stronghold, and I think they'll continue to be. When we talk about value, I think it's more about being selective. You know, investors that can be agile in this environment, they're the ones that are going to be outperforming. And it is back to that old-fashioned environment of stock picking to an extent as well, I think, if you're going to, to weather this storm. But of course, you know, Fed actions will remain key. If they do step up the pace of tapering, then I think that will take the wind out of a lot of the growth stocks. But as I said, that's not really my base case. I think the one thing that central banks are going to want to avoid is a policy mistake. You know, look at the ECB back in 2011. They've never been able to raise rates since. And the last thing the Fed wants to do is raise rates and then be forced to unwind that. So I think the middle of next year, even that is too early to, to really start to put the pressure on, on rates for central banks and for the Fed in particular. Hey, Christian, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. Christian Lawrence, Rabobank Senior Cross Asset Strategist. Thank you so very much. All right, coming up, we're going to stay with this story, how the latest COVID variant is going to wreak havoc on air travel. We saw those stocks get hit really hard on Friday. They're shaking off some of those losses and the turbulence today, but still the outlook not so great. This is Bloomberg. Omicron variant weighing on those travel stocks. Airlines trying to bounce back today, but they took a pretty big beating on Friday. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow has more. Ed, we were talking about the rotation with value in small caps. Right. Let's talk about the reopening uh, and the travel stocks.
Yeah, 40 minutes into the U.S. session. It's actually a mixed picture, right? Some softness in the United and American Airlines. Strength in actually other stocks like cruise ships. Carnival up half a percentage point. And then you're looking as well at Expedia, which was one of the hardest hit Friday. Compare that with the European session, and we did actually see a sustained rebound throughout Monday session so far. The question being, where do we really go from here, right? Morgan Stanley out with a note saying that this is a sector that is so vulnerable to vol volatility because of the news cycle. What do we actually know about this variant Monday morning more than what we knew on Friday and that's the point that Morgan Stanley makes that as news comes out expect these types of stocks to move if you bring up the stock 600 index travel and leisure subsector you also make the point that even though we've seen a rebound Monday particularly in Europe over two sessions, we're still in high single-digit declines. And there's an idea of whether this is priced in or not. You've got Citigroup talking about the UK in particular, whose measure has been to reintroduce PCR testing and mandatory self-isolation until you return a negative te test. They look at the market, they look at the industry and say, yep, continental Europe's going to follow suit. That is a headwind to demand going into the Christmas period, demand that was waning already. I also want to talk about Asia really quickly. We've got a rebound in Europe, but if you look at the BI gauge of airline stocks in Europe, the yellow line, we fell for a second consecutive day. And if you look at some of the measures that are being enacted in Japan, in Singapore, in the Philippines, they moved very quick and very severely. And it's Asian airlines that have outperformed this year relative to the white and blue lines, which, of course, are Europe and the United States. So we don't know much about the variant, but there are different reactions with different pace in different regions. Hard to keep up. Yeah, hard to keep up and hard to make booking plans. Ed, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow uh, joining us there. Uh, Guy, I'm assuming... You've had to change some vacation plans. Uh, as ever, but that, that's just the new normal, isn't that's it? it yeah. You book something, then you have to change it. Um, the airlines generally are getting better at it, but if you want to book ski lessons or if you want to book transfers, all this kind of stuff, that's money you're basically putting at risk. So people are becoming much more cautious. And Alex, we, I think we did learn something over the last 72 hours, and that is that governments are on a hair trigger ready to pull new sanctions, uh, new... Um, travel restrictions, new problems for travellers uh, forward very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the travel sector is responding to here. Uh, it's less about, uh, as Ed was saying, the, the stuff we don't know. What we do know is that governments are responding really quickly to it. Sidharth Philip, uh, joining us in the Bloomberg Travel Team. Sid, that's the issue here, isn't it? The, it it's not... The, the kind of the fact that we don't know anything, the fact that we don't know we haven't we've got a, a, a variant we don't know much about, it's that governments have just responded straight away. Absolutely. So the governments have actually been acting really, really quickly. And that's a problem for the airline industry because it dampens confidence for uh, bookings. And especially as we're getting into the busy winter season where people are getting ready to travel, uh, that's the busier season after, outside of summer. And so the airline industry was really hoping for some sort of turnaround this winter. Mm -hmm. And that looks like it might be hard won because while we don't know much about the variant, governments are reacting really quickly and it obviously that means consumer sentiment is pretty weak. Well, also, Sid, I have to imagine that this is going to push back any kind of business travel as we know it. Absolutely. I mean, business travel obviously depends on sort of ease of getting in and getting out. And as countries put up uh, quarantine measures and PCR testing and other sort of barriers to entry, companies might actually be less inclined to send people on business trips. And that could see business trips falling and especially as you get into like, the busy conference season, which is typically in winter, that actually might seem a big fall. Yeah, ironically, there's a big travel conference happening in London this week that mm. you and I will be spending some time at. They're having to come up with new plans really quickly. Absolutely. I mean, organizers are scrambling to arrange for testing for overseas delegates, as well as isolation bays, because the UK has now mandated day two tests for everybody. And that includes PCR tests rather than antigen tests. So it is much harder regardless of vaccination status. And obviously, as Ed mentioned, when the UK does something, the risk is that other countries might follow that example. Hey, Sid, before we let you go, which is the worst airline off right now? At the moment, it really looks like a pretty bad news across the board. So I think the long haul carriers will be harder hit because they tend to be impacted by government rules and restrictions. So the shorter haul carriers are the ones that are sort of easier and they have it easier rather than the long haul ones. All right, Sid, thanks a lot. Guy, I told you, you should have come earlier. Sid Phillip uh, joining us from Bloomberg. Now he's yep. never going to get to New York. You're bad. Could have had my croissants and beer. All right, coming up, <laughs> Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey uh, will be stepping down. Trading the stock uh, is halted right now. We'll break that down even more. This is Bloomberg.
Um, England reporting two further cases of Omicron within the last couple of minutes. We'll keep you updated with that. Live from London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. Um, one of the other big pieces of news today, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey stepping down. Uh, this, according to a Bloomberg source, trading on the shares, uh, in the shares, halted. But Bloomberg's Dave Wilson is looking at the impact that this could all have. Dave. Well, we certainly saw the impact once the report started coming out about what uh, Dorsey's future will be. Uh, shares of Twitter were up as much as 11 percent in early trading before that halt, which occurred about 20 minutes into the trading day here in the U.S. Still going on. Uh, no announcement yet from Twitter. Uh, nonetheless, though, I mean, you got to remember that Jack Dorsey has run Twitter as well as the financial payments company Square since 2015. And over that time, Square has been a much stronger performer. I mean, Twitter hasn't even been able to keep up uh, with its peers among the FANG stocks or uh, the expanded NYC FANG Plus index. You know, that's where you find the likes of uh, Facebook, now Meta Platforms, and uh, Google's owner Alphabet. So some direct competition there. Mm -hmm. You know, beyond that, I mean, you talk about competition. Look at Twitter versus Square over the last few years. You know, Square, the much faster growing company in terms of revenue, analysts expecting it to more than double this year. I mean, Twitter, you know, they're looking for a 37 percent increase, which is not shabby, but nothing like you're seeing out of Square at this point. And, you know, Twitter has certainly had its challenges in terms of user growth over time as well. You know, last year adding something like 40 million users. This year, uh, not even half that. Uh, of course, uh, you know, they've had the issue with having to remove uh, former President Donald Trump from the platform after the January 6th uh, riots in the Capitol. You know, so those kinds of issues aren't going away. Things like misinformation and bullying and all the concerns that show up with social media companies affecting Twitter as well. Hey, uh, Dave, to that point, um, how does Twitter fare during COVID, particularly in light of what you were just talking about, especially related to its peers, uh, social media? Well, it just hasn't been able to keep up. I mean, it's not as one-sided as, say, Twitter versus Square has been over time, but it's certainly there. I mean, you look at uh, Google's owner alphabet, you look at Pinterest, those shares have more than doubled in the last two years. Twitter hasn't been able to manage that. And heck, Snap's owner, Snapchat is more than, you know, the owner of Snapchat is more than tripled over that time. So yeah. there you go. Yeah, good point. All right, Dave, thanks a lot. Really appreciate Bloomberg's Dave Wilson uh, joining us there. All right, coming up, more on the Omicron variant here. Uh, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is speaking right now. Uh, Lawrence Gostin, a Georgetown professor of global health law, will be joining us next. The latest is the New York City health chief is advising wearing masks in all indoor locations. Those restrictions, they're coming. This is Bloomberg. Employees to get vaccinated and encouraging people, obviously, in light of all the information we have, the quicker you... Live from New York, I'm Alex Steele. I'm with Guy Johnson over in London. This is Bloomberg Markets. We are one hour into trading session right here in the U.S. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here with some of the movers uh, and the market. So, yes, of course, this is sort of a move higher after Friday's carnage, but I wonder how long it lasts here. It'll be interesting to see that, Alex, because there was such a big carnage or big sell-off on Friday on big volume, too. So is today just a bounce back? Or is it the start of uh, something real to the upside? We'll see. But right here are some of the top movers on the day. Moderna, speaking of the new variant Omicron, uh, up 7.6%, saying that they'll have a new vaccine ready in 2022, so not so far out. Tesla up about 4%. No new news on the tape, but folks want in on this by the dip day on one of the uh, bigger moving momentum stocks. And then Twitter, of course, halted earlier, up as much as 11% on the news that CEO Jack Dorsey is stepping down. Of course, he's also the CEO of Square and focusing on cryptocurrencies. Now, from a broader standpoint, if we take a look at uh, what's happening, we're going to see right there the S&P 500 up about nine tenths of one percent. It's best day in almost uh, in about six weeks or so. The stock 600 up nicely, up 1.1 percent. Brent crude, a big bounce back here. This is a big story and also a big bounce back for yield. So on the fearful day, that risk off day on Friday, crude oil down, I think, 12 percent, the worst day since March of 2020. That was the degree, degree of selling the fear of what the new variant it could mean for the economy. Bonds had been in a big rally, but today a reversal. And in fact, it's very interesting because we're at a critical point here for crude oil. If we go into the Bloomberg terminal quickly, we are going to see that in 2020, crude oil clearly plunged right below the support, the long-term support of the 200-day moving 
average, flirted with it uh, at one point later in the year. This is the first move back below that 200 day moving average uh, since that time period. It's going to be interesting to see, Guy, whether or not these long term buyers of crude oil and other risk assets step up or again, if this is some sort of head fake to bring you back to Alex's first question. We just don't know right now, but today it does feel a bit more risk on than it did last Friday. We'll see exactly what OPEC has to say a little bit later on this week. We'll certainly cover that extensively. Um, breaking news over the last few minutes. Let me just run you through it. The UK has two cases, two more cases of Omicron. OK, that's piece number one. Uh, the second piece is we're getting a statement out from the G7 uh, health ministers. They're basically saying that Omicron requires urgent action, whatever that means. They're going to meet again fairly shortly. And then, Alex, in terms of what we're seeing on your part of the, in your part of the world, uh, so we have a daycare man vaccine mandate now that's going to come in that is going to be something that I think is going to be problematic. And we are seeing an increased advisory relating to uh, mask wearing, as you point out. Surprising that people aren't wearing masks, but uh, just anecdotally, a lot of people aren't. Uh, Lawrence Gostin, Georgetown University Professor of Global Health, joining us now to give us his take on all of this. Professor, thus far, do you think the response from government is about right or too much or too little? Well, you know, it's really almost nondescript. I mean, the you know governments are kind of flapping all over the place. Um, but what they really should be doing um, is vaccinating their own populations, including with boosters. And they should also be uh, really ramping up vaccination of the world. You know, that's really the only way we can prepare for this. There, if it's as infectious as we worry that it might be, um, most people are going to get it. Um, and we, when you get it, we want you to be nicely vaccinated. And if you are, I don't think we're going to have a big problem. If you're not, we could have huge hospitalization surges. So, Professor, um, do, you, do you think that mandates are a good thing? And I just to, to pivot off of what Guy had said, uh, New York City mandating that child care workers get vaccinated by December 20th. I could see a scenario where then all of a sudden you lose child care workers and then parents can't yeah. go into work. Yeah. I mean, are, do mandates I I work? Yeah, I heard you, Alex, off air. You said, uh oh, what's going to happen if we uh, if we end up uh, with with child care mandates? I actually do support them um, because if you send your child to daycare, you want your child to be safe um, and asking a daycare worker to be vaccinated um, is absolutely a reasonable thing to do. Uh, it'll keep our kids safe. It'll keep uh, the co-workers safe. Um, and it's just a smart, common sense thing that will really, you know, buttress our children against any future variants. Just in terms of the timeline we're working with here, Professor, um, in terms of understanding the clinical manifestation that the new variant brings, when do you think we're going to start getting a true understanding? Because at the moment we're flying blind. Yeah, we are flying blind. You know, right now, um, you know, we're kind of lurching from complacency because we thought we had this under control in Europe and the United States, although Europe has had a spike. Um, uh, so we were seeing the end of the tunnel. Um, but now um, we've lurched from com complacency to panic. Um, you know, neither of those extremes are a good way to go. You know, there isn't going to be a magic day when we say, oh, we really know, understand this. But I think Within two or three weeks, we're going to start to understand the characteristics of this variant. Um, in, and what we expect is, is that, yes, it'll probably be, you know, quite transmissible. Um, and if it's, you know, even a fitter virus than the Delta variant, you know, that's going to be worrying because remember, Delta is extraordinarily infectious, nearly as infectious as chickenpox. If, if this new variant Omicron is, is more infectious than that, then we have a lot of reason to worry because a lot more people are going to get infected. Yeah. But at this point, we don't have any evidence that it's going to cause more serious disease, more hospitalizations. And although probably from our experience with Delta, that the vaccine effectiveness is going to be a little bit less than it would otherwise be, Vaccines will still be robust, and I do think that if needed, um, particularly with the messenger RNA vaccines, we are going to get a yeah. targeted vaccine. Well, Professor, 
let me ask you this. You talked about booster shots and vaccinations. Um, we in developed markets can talk about boosters, but in emerging markets, we're not even remotely at that stage yet. It feels like the path forward is we have to vaccinate emerging economies ASAP. What is the best way to do that? You know, I'm so glad you raised that, Alex, because that's been lost in the conversation. If we've learned anything from this new variant, um, we've learned that as long as SARS-CoV-2 remains unchecked in a largely unvaccinated population in low and middle income countries, particularly in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, that there, we're gonna get more and more variants. So what, are, what is the best way? Every country in the world right now should ramp up its donations um, in a massive yep. and coordinated way. And we should transfer technology um, to the South African hubs and Indian hubs and others that can make their own vaccines. So we've got to Professor, final, we understand that. Final quick question from me. Increasingly, it looks like many of these new variants with huge numbers of mutations are coming from immunocompromised patients, possibly HIV patients in Africa. Yeah. They don't respond well to vaccines. And as a result of which, we find ourselves in a situation where they are largely unprotected, but provide the opportunity for the virus to mutate in a significant way. How do we solve that problem? You know, that's a really hard problem. I mean, I think the, the end, we've got an interconnected epidemic. Um, of HIV and COVID-19. And yes, one of the prevailing theories is, is that Omicron might have just developed inside an immune compromised patient. The best way to do that is to get anti uh, retroviral medications um, quickly and sustainably um, in sub-Saharan Africa and other places mm -hmm. where HIV is prevalent. All right, Lawrence, thanks a lot. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, Lawrence Gostin, a Georgetown University professor of global health law. Thank you very much. Well, coming up, this no doubt dominating the conversation in D.C., but there's still also a lot more on deck there. you got the debt ceiling. Uh, you have money markets getting in gear for a key week as well. The budget needs to uh, be uh, increased by Friday. And then, of course, you have the infrastructure bill. Henry Atre of Veda Partners joins us now. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Stefan Bantel, the Moderna CEO. That's at 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden meets today with CEOs of companies from a variety of sectors. He'll discuss supply chain bottlenecks and the administration's efforts to combat inflation. Chief executives from Best Buy, Mattel, Kroger and Samsung are amongst those expected to attend in person. The CEOs of Walmart and CVS will attend virtually. In New York, final jury selection and opening argument is set for today in the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. The British socialite is accused of grooming underage girls for sex with the late financier Jeffrey Epstein. She faces as much as 40 years in prison. The next flashpoint between Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the U.S. may be auto-content rules. Canada is leaning towards forming a common front with Mexico in a fight with the U.S. over the origin of auto parts. The rules are part of the overhauled North American Free Trade Agreement. Canada and Mexico believe more regionally produced parts qualify for duty-free shipping that the U.S. is allowing. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So some breaking news for you. Uh, Jack Dorsey, as we reported, stepping down as CEO from Twitter. The new CEO will now be Parag Agarwal. Uh, he is currently the chief technology officer. He's been that since 2017. He's been at Twitter uh, for more than a decade. He will succeed now, uh, Jack Dorsey. So Prague Agrawal uh, will be a CEO and also join as member of a board of the board effective immediately. Uh, there's also a Twitter announcing an independent board chair, Brett Taylor. Uh, and so uh, Brett Taylor joining the board as well as independent uh, uh, chair there. So lots of news with Twitter. Stock not moving. Stock still halted. Before the news, it was up just about 3%, so giving up some of its gains uh, from earlier in the session. We'll bring the price action when it starts trading again. 
All right, in the meantime, let's go to D.C. because Congress is finally back in session. And they face a lot of deadlines here. First among them is avoiding a federal government shutdown on Friday. The current funding is going to expire then. We're joined now by Bloomberg's government's Emily Wilkins. Emily, that's just the first thing that they have to do in the next few weeks. It is going to be an incredibly busy month for Congress. They've got that shutdown deadline on December 3rd, uh, then moving a couple weeks to December 15th. They have the debt limit. That's going to need to be raised. We're still seeing a standoff between Republicans and Democrats over that. Republicans saying that they will not help Democrats lift the debt ceiling again, uh, but Democrats holding out, not really moving forward with that reconciliation process that would allow them to do it on their own. You also have that social welfare and tax plan known as the Build back better from President Biden. The House was able to move that before the Thanksgiving recess, but now the, the ball is now in the Senate's court, and there's still lots of questions about whether various policies might be changed. Uh, there's also no guarantee that we're going to see the end of the government funding debate this Friday. Uh, where Bloomberg News reported today that there could be another short-term stopgap measure that could take us into January of next year, and that just sets up another round of debates as far as whether we're going to get a full year of funding uh, for fiscal year 2022. Emily, great stuff. Setting it up nicely. Thank you very much indeed. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government joining us from D.C. Let's carry on the conversation now. For more, we're joined by Henrietta Therese, the Feeder Partners Director of Economic Policy. Henrietta, it's a long list and there's not much time in theory to get it all done. Um, as we were just hearing, uh, you've got a short-term funding uh, of the government that needs to get resolved, you've got the debt ceiling, you've got the defence budget, uh, you've obviously got Build Back Better. Can you walk me through how you think we're going to see Congress dealing with these or not dealing with all of these issues? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. I think the debt ceiling probably is going to be a mid-January issue. So if you're looking for something to sort of kick into next year, I think the debt ceiling is probably not going to be something that they address this cycle. I think they'll probably get to that next next year. I think it's pretty um, appropriate to read between the lines on what Secretary Yellen has sent to Congress. She has certainty through December 15th, but after that, things are uncertain. Uncertain is very different than oh my gosh, there's going to be a default. So I anticipate that the debt ceiling issue gets kicked into next year. Um, I would, however, really like to see the Build Back Better agenda pick up some momentum and steam this year, because I'll start to get more anxious about that, even becoming law at all, if they have to debate it in 2022. 2022 is a midterm election cycle. We'll have new data on the jobs front, which continues to be better than expected. We'll have new problematic data on inflation. Supply chains will still be disrupted. And I think you can be uh, in a situation of a mixed bag on the BBB if you lead in the next year. Um, to that end, I think the new variant of Delta, if you want to find, uh, excuse me, of COVID, if you want to find any silver lining, is that an uptick in COVID headlines drives momentum for government intervention and stimulus. So I would be looking just for this specific week for behind the scenes action on the Build Back Better agenda. I think the size is gonna get much smaller, but yeah. I think there is a path forward for it to pass before the end of this year. And of course, government funding, as Emily mentioned a moment ago, needs to be dealt with by Friday. And the jury's out on yeah. whether they'll kick it into like December 17th or next year. Well, Henry, I'll pick up on what you were just saying, because that was my question. Uh, uh, Omicron, that makes it harder or easier to think about something like Build Back Better and to deal with the debt ceiling? Yes, absolutely. So as Omicron picks up, you see um, renewed government intervention. Right now, we're at the travel ban stage. But what is going to happen in New York, for instance? Are they going to go the way of Austria and shut down? Are they going to reinstate lockdowns? Are we going to need to have a conversation about whether restaurants and businesses need to shut down again? Um, Y'all have been talking about child care. All those issues, as they become front and center again, they spur the need for federal action and create a glide path for passing legislation that otherwise would be very difficult. We'd love a crisis in D.C. Mm -hmm. So ironically, as COVID picks up and a new wave comes forward, even though that was widely anticipated to occur in the winter months this year, whether it was Delta or some new strain, the um, uptick makes it easier for the BBB to become law. Should it, should it decline or get um, addressed very yep. quickly, then I think that'll pose problems for the BBB. OK, let, let's, let's look at this another way. There is a, a lot to do around it, and we need to figure out some key compromises, even within the party, within the Democrats, to get this done. Do you think that if we kick it into next year, it's going to become even more problematic? 
we're going to start to get close to the midterm. In fact, all of these issues, presumably the further out we push them, the harder they are to solve. Absolutely. This is a want to pass piece of legislation, not a must pass piece of legislation. So if I want to pass this, I need things like momentum. I need urgency. I need catastrophe and government uh, federal. Uh, voter support for federal intervention. As we see um, inflation continue to be a problem, the calls are only going to get louder that we've had too much government intervention, too much subsidization, um, and maybe some of these federal programs should be expired so that the uh, inflation numbers can come down and stop this federal subsidization. That's going to be one of the arguments. Um, they're going to have to vote on really contentious issues, whether we strip out the immigration component, as I suspect they will no matter what, um, the SALT deduction. You know, nobody really wants to talk about that um, on the progressive side, but moderates do, especially in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and California. So it splits the Democratic Party. There are issues about the taxation on excess carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. There are issues to do with the electric vehicles tax credit and who gets to apply for them and who doesn't. There's a labor standard component in the bill right now that's going to be a problem for the Toyota plant in West Virginia, which, of course, is principal and paramount because of Senator Joe Manchin. So there's a lot that needs to be negotiated. The longer you give the party to negotiate internally, the more fragile it becomes. Mm -hmm. We saw that, you know, for the last 11 months now. So um, you want this to pass with a year-end deadline. And I would say the biggest driver is probably the expiration of the child tax credit. That reverts back to its 2020 levels at the end of this year. So that's probably going to be the predominant talking point in the next couple of weeks is, hey, we really got to up, re-up that uh, expanded child tax credit of $3,000 yeah. or $3,600 per child in okay. 2022. And Henrietta, um, President Biden got a little bit of a um, reprieve when it came to high gasoline prices and high oil prices uh, over the last few days. Uh, OPEC Plus is going to be, the technical committee is going to be meeting later on this week. And I'm wondering, what is your base case here? Like, do you think that OPEC Plus goes as far as to sort of take oil off the market? I'm just wondering how far they're willing to push President Biden here. I think they're willing to push, it, push him pretty far. Um, and you've seen the administration is willing to go in every other direction it possibly can, releasing uh, some of the reserves in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve recently, calling on OPEC to do X, Y, and Z. You know, the administration is really taking all these external measures that it can. And I think that OPEC Plus probably sees that and says, you know, the administration is going to be in a place where they're going to respond to the extent that they will. But we have an opportunity here in a shifting climate environment to maybe make some changes on our production expectation. And we'll push the administration as far as we can. And I expect that's what they'll do. Henrietta, busy week. Perfect timing. Busy week for Henrietta. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Henrietta Trace, uh, as you can tell, because it's her phone. Beta Partners, Director uh, of Economic Policy. Thank you very much indeed. European equities are selling off pretty hard right now. We're down towards session lows. Stock 600 is only up by six tenths of 1%. We've gone 470, 466 really quickly. We'll continue to keep you updated with the markets. This is Bloomberg. Thirty-five minutes to go until the end of the uh, European session. Uh, we're watching very carefully to figure out exactly what is going on because we are seeing something of a sell-off right now. Key stocks that you want to focus on. Uh, BT Group, that's M&A, which is interesting. In a day like today, there are still idiosyncratic stories that are moving individual names. So BT up on the back of that. But look at IAG and look at Cine Cineworld, which I think are really interesting. So IAG, probably one of the most exposed airlines in the world to long-haul uh, terrible day on Friday, bounced this morning, definitely now fading that move. So we're only up by eight tenths of 1%, which is meaning to gain a little bit more traction, but nevertheless, unconvincing, it seems, at this point. We still don't know exactly how global uh, governments are going to continue to react to this. Are restrictions going to get tightened? PCR tests on arrival, that's a really difficult one to deal with. But domestically, it's interesting, actually, Cine World Group uh, up by nearly 3% at the moment. So the market is definitely separating out 
what is happening in terms of domestic stocks and those exposed to, to international travel. Uh, so an interesting kind of yin and yang there in terms of the reaction. What are we going to do next? We're going to continue to keep you updated as to what is happening on the European close with the emergence of Omicron. Uh, David Heyman, professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, will be joining us. He spent an awfully long time at the World Health Organization. He's got some great context that he can bring us as to what is happening here. Not just a domestic story, but also an international story. He's going to bring those two together. The close is next. This is Bloomberg.